My mistake was that I took the knife and, well, the first stab was here. And, well, that's where she fell. Yes, she was bleeding a lot. She was trying to mumble. I put my hand here to stop the bleeding. March 10th of the year 2014 marked the beginning of a new school year. For many, as you know, this meant the end of fun and vacations. But for Jessica Mayerly Alsa, a 16-year-old student, it was not like that. Passionate about school, she left her neighborhood, El Perdomo, in Ciudad Bolivar, south of Bogota, Colombia, at 7.30 a.m. She walked only three blocks to Ismael Perdomo School, where she was in ninth grade. During the morning, the girl participated in extracurricular activities at her school. Around 11.30, during the midday break, she decided to leave the establishment to take advantage of her free hour before continuing with classes. However, she did not return to her classroom for the 12.30 class. Neither her teachers nor her classmates knew that they would never see her again with Vilma. But after one in the afternoon, she contacted a classmate to inform her that she was feeling ill and was going to be absent. Three hours later, she called her mother to tell her that she had already arrived home and was doing homework. Upon hearing this, her mother felt relieved, thinking that her daughter was safe. But what she didn't know was that she wasn't at home and that in reality, the young woman had met up with her friend Andrea Esperanza Valdez, who is 21 years old. From that moment on, a series of events marked by jealousy, betrayal, and if that wasn't enough, witchcraft unfolded. But what happened to Jessica Mayor Alza because her friend ended her life? The reason is, hold on, because it's going to leave you speechless. Before addressing the events of the day in question, it is essential to understand the relationship between both young women and how such a tragic situation came about. Or well, let's say between a young woman and a girl. Jessica. Jessica lived with her mother, stepfather and her little son in an apartment on the first floor. They did many things together. She was my matchmaker, my accomplice, my plot, everything. floor of a condominium. The friendship between Andrea and Jessica began three years before the tragic events after meeting several times in the neighborhood as Andrea lived in a house across from her apartments. What started with simple courtesy greetings gradually turned into a friendship that strengthened over time. They had many things in common, even the fact that both were mothers of children of almost the same age who went to the same daycare. Both hoped that one day their children would also be together, have a friendship as special, well special in quotes, as theirs. They still didn't know what awaited them in the future, obviously. The young women used to go out dancing together, drinking alcohol, using illegal substances, and even stealing from small shops, hiding their loot in a semi-abandoned house that belonged to Andrea's mother. This place became their refuge where they shared all their secrets. However, Jessica was hiding a very big one that would end their friendship. Our friendship started like this, right? Normal, the trust, what we shouldn't do today, I think like this, no. What we women should not do, to have and bring the buddy or the friend, the partner, the mate to the house, especially if you have your partner in a stable home, right? Their friendship was soon to falter. The turning point occurred when Jessica revealed to Andrea that an apartment on the second floor would become available because a neighbor was moving. Excited by the possibility of being even closer, she also suggested that Andrea move there. Andrea, enthusiastic, accepted the proposal and moved with her son and husband. This further strengthened the friendship, but it would not last long. The proximity made Andrea start to perceive that Jessica's kindness towards her husband was crossing a limit that is part of the unwritten code in friendship. Friends do not flirt with their friends' partners. However, Andrea let it pass, thinking that it was her insecurities that were making her believe that. Or so she thought, because days later, when they got together to drink in the abandoned house, everything would come to light. After drinking and smoking, both were immersed in a cloud of substances. In that state, Jessica couldn't bear the weight of her secrets any longer, and amidst laughter and jokes, she confessed to Andrea that she was seeing Jonathan, her husband. 
When Andrea heard the confession, she didn't believe it and started laughing uproariously, thinking it was just another one of the jokes she used to make. However, Jessica wasn't laughing. Her serious face showed that this time there was no punchline to her joke. When I see her very confident in what she's telling me, I question her and ask why. What emotions are you experiencing? Disappointment or anger? What happened there? Like a total downer, like sadness. When Jessica's parents arrived at the apartment and the night of March 10th progressed, they were surprised to find neither their daughter nor their grandson at home. They immediately contacted the daycare and were even more surprised to discover that their grandson was still there, waiting for his mother to pick him up. This situation deeply puzzled the couple, as Jessica had never abandoned her son who, by the way, was the result of a previous relationship with a professional soldier. Thus, the hours passed without news, so they decided to alert the authorities who acted quickly, because it was a minor. After questioning the neighbors, a witness claimed to have seen Jessica in front of Andrea Valdez's mother's house, her best friend around 11.30 at night. That clue turned out to be one of the most promising in the progress of the investigation. However, at that time, the authorities could not imagine what the next day would bring at 7 in the morning when the neighbors informed the emergency line about a suspicious suitcase found in a wooded area in the El Progreso neighborhood. Despite their unease, they did not dare to open it for fear of discovering something disturbing inside. And they were not wrong, because members of the security forces arrived at the place where the suitcase was abandoned. Upon opening it, a nauseating smell emanated from inside, coming from something covered with a white sheet. Upon removing the cloth, they discovered the lifeless body of a young woman with straight black hair. However, the main clue confirming the victim's identity was the school uniform she was wearing. The investigators went to this place, to the school, which appeared in the uniform's logo, and after obtaining a photograph of the student, they confirmed the sad news that it was Jessica. No one could believe who would be capable of doing that to a teenager, to a girl. Many had doubts and even thought that it could have been some miscreant who crossed her path. But the authorities had one person in their sights, someone much closer than many imagined. And what was it that helped me have so much strength to be able to do that? The pain, the anger and the desperation, not wanting to get my mom into trouble. Thanks to the testimony of the last witness who saw her alive, the police proceeded to raid the semi-abandoned house where Jessica and Andrea used to meet. At the place, they found evidence of the crime they had tried to hide, including traces that had been cleaned with cleaning products. In the house, they also found red traces concentrated in one room and scattered in other rooms. The above was discovered thanks to studies with special lights that forensic scientists used to reveal the disturbing stains of a disturbing crime, of a bloody crime. It was thus that Jessica's best friend, the one she trusted for years, became the main suspect in her loss. She immediately began to be sought by justice because apparently she had fled. However, on Thursday at 6.40 in the evening, just two days after the event, she herself decided to go to the police station and admitted her authorship in the case, showing remorse. However, she refused to accept the aggravated homicide charges attributed to her by the prosecutor's office. She claimed it was self-defense. Despite this, she was sent to jail while the investigation continued. Everything one does is paid for, right? Therefore, I decided myself, I'm going to go pay for it. I surrendered. I left the child with her paternal grandmother. I told her what happened. She didn't understand either. I just told her that I took great care of the girl. The detectives believed that the underage girl had a secret relationship with her husband and that she took revenge for this betrayal. In addition, they suspected that she had not worked alone. This event seemed to be the work of more than one person. The prosecutor's office issued two arrest warrants against Andrea's mother, Esperanza Contreras, and brother Victor Valdez as her accomplices. As expected, the suspects were not at their home when the police broke in. Both traveled by land to Tolima. However, a few weeks after the events, 
They stopped their journey and went into hiding in a hotel in Quindío, unaware that the authorities were closely following their steps. The police waited for them to let their guard down and they were caught inside the hotel completely off guard. Throughout the entire trip back to Bogota, the officers felt uncomfortable with the presence of the lady in the back seat who throughout the journey made prayers with strange words from what seemed like an ancestral language. It turned out that Andrea's mother was known in her neighborhood as a practitioner of witchcraft, but not white magic, the kind that helps the sick and to get a job. Supposedly, the woman practiced black magic to harm other people. Many neighbors also had no doubt that she had participated in Jessica's death in a dark ritual to keep her away from her daughter's husband, and the authorities believed that Andrea also practiced dark arts or witchcraft just like her mother. Santiago Amaya Nazar, a psychologist with a master's degree in forensic and penitentiary psychological evaluation and also the academic director of the Colombian Association of Criminology, explained that the criminal could present a schizo personality disorder as a possible explanation for her tendency towards witchcraft and violent behavior. According to the expert, esoteric thinking in itself did not imply a greater probability of violent behavior but together with a mental disorder, acts such as murder could occur, as is believed to have been the case with her. At the first hearing for Jessica's murder, before entering the room, Andrea maintained that she was innocent. However, the investigators believed otherwise. I will... I killed my friend, I tell her that. Are you sure? Can you imagine how many years they will give you for what you are telling me? But what happened? How did Andrea end up killing her best friend? Now it was in the hands of justice to evaluate the evidence and determine the responsibilities of mother, daughter and brother in this crime that shocked an entire country. According to the reconstruction of events put together by investigators, the crime occurred on Monday night, hours after the student disappeared after leaving her class. Initial investigations indicated that Valdez would have murdered the schoolgirl after attacking her with a bladed weapon and that the act would have something to do with a jealousy episode. The police believed that this woman's mother, through Santeria rituals, had discovered that her daughter's best friend wanted to take her husband away, so she convinced her that she had to get rid of her if she wanted to keep her family together. What witchcraft, but no, never, never. I am very believing in my God. He is the only one who has power and control over all of us. I sing that as to increase, I repeat, and tell them as to awaken the morbid curiosity of human beings, right? And there in the... Humble dwelling of the neighborhood, they remained throughout the rest of the afternoon and well into the night, conversing as always without giving Jessica any indication that something bad was about to happen. Then, from one moment to the next, the mother and her brother would have joined the meeting. They talked for a few hours and consumed fiery water and the little herb of happiness, the magic broccoli, and so in a deep state of alcohol and substances, above all the exaltation, Andrea could no longer hide her resentment and she reproached her best friend for having gotten involved with her husband. The woman screamed and cried with rancor while Jessica tried to reason with her. However, she could not calm her down and quickly the discussion got out of control. The young woman had no time to react when Andrea pulled out a sharp knife and gave her six stabs in the neck full of hatred. When her victim finally stopped breathing, Andrea's anger and coldness did not stop there. She needed to hide the body at all costs, fearing to ruin what she had tried to protect at all costs, which was her perfect family. Her solution was to hide her friend's body in a suitcase. With the help of her accomplices, they folded the body as best they could into the suitcase. But to their dismay, the young woman's legs wouldn't fit inside. I couldn't fit her well into the suitcase, so I found a saw, right? So yes, that's when I proceeded to try to fit her in properly. After a few hours, well into the night and with no neighbors watching her steps, Andrea decided to erase all traces that Jessica had ever been there. She stealthily left with the suitcase in hand, but it was so heavy that she couldn't get far from the crime scene. 
So without compassion, she abandoned the suitcase hiding the victim in a nearby field to the scene of the crime, saying goodbye to her husband's lover. Much calmer now thinking she had committed the perfect crime, Andrea immediately returned to the house of horror and throughout the night, until the sun came up, she proceeded to clean the floors, furniture and walls stained with the blood of her best friend. Andrea totally disagreed with the police's version of events. According to her, she never planned to take the life of her best friend that night. She didn't deny committing the crime, that was entirely true, but her story of what happened in the house was very different. The night when both of them met in the abandoned house and after Jessica confessed that she had a secret relationship with her husband, things started to heat up to the point where the lover pulled out a knife from her purse and pointed it at her friend. Wait. He wanted to remove her to stay out. Of the way, to keep everything I had and with the father of my daughter. Fearing for her life, Andrea threw herself at the teenager with all her strength and took the knife in her hands. In the midst of a cloud of confusion, terror and adrenaline, she made the worst decision of her life and attacked Jessica. The first stab wound she received was in her neck, followed by a flurry of stabs. Once she came to her senses and realized what she had done, it was already too late to do anything. Her friend was lifeless on the floor, surrounded by her own vital fluid. But suddenly, Andrea stopped her flight when her mother's face came to mind. At that moment, she knew she couldn't leave that problem at home, as sometimes the woman slept there, as did her brother. Did you dismember Jessica by yourself afterwards? Yes. Miss, my mom traveled a lot. She had an Andrea. So she took the suitcase and bounced it out of the house. Because of how heavy it was, until she got to the field behind the house where she threw the body, she quickly returned to the house and began to wash away any trace of Jessica that could implicate her. Before the trial for Jessica's murder began, which implicated not only her best friend, but also her mother and brother. An angry mob destroyed the house where the crime occurred. Dozens of transient neighborhood residents who had watched the young woman grow up and couldn't believe that something like this could happen in their neighborhood retaliated and destroyed the walls of the house and made a bonfire in front where they burned the belongings of those involved, virtually emptying the house completely. Andres is a murderer. What do you say to those people? You tell them that we are not guilty of our reactions, right? Yeah, I decided to surrender. I decided to go to the authorities and say, hey, look, this, this, this happened to me. You had never thought about it before. It was something that got out of my hands. It was something I never premeditated. The trial in which Esperanza Contreras Valencia, 59 years old, and her son, Victor Fabio Valdez Contreras, 23, both denied being accomplices in Andrea's murder. However, after declaring themselves innocent, both were sent to the Buen Pastor prison and the Modelo prison in Bogota, respectively. On the other hand, the main perpetrator of Jessica's murder was sentenced to 28 years in prison. At first, Andrea was transferred to the women's prison in Bogota. However, she was later transferred and confined in the Medellin prison because the previous prison was maximum security and she was not considered a dangerous inmate. So finally, her mother and brother were released from charges because justice could not support the theory of their complicity in the crime. So then both returned to their normal life and raised Andrea's daughter, who over the years stopped visiting her mother, leaving her forgotten just like her husband, for whom she had committed such an atrocious crime as murdering a friend. He tells me that Jessica's son is named Christian. If you could have him in front of you, or if perhaps he saw this episode, what would you say to him? Would you ask for his forgiveness? Sorry. Sorry because... Maybe when I took the knife from Jessica, I should have reacted differently. These days, I think so. Currently, Andrea is almost halfway through her 11-year sentence. She still insists it was in self-defense and that if it hadn't been Jessica, it would have been her who was the victim that night. 
The girl still carries the guilt of what she did and regrets her reaction blinded by feelings and desperation. She says her prison time has been difficult. Andrea doesn't share a cell with anyone and is in a cell exclusive to her, isolated from others due to the assaults, the constant harassment from the inmates and above all the guilt. Andrea has tried to take her own life. Even though she still has half of her sentence to serve, Andrea dreams of teaching in schools when she is free so that young people do not make the same mistakes she did, that they do not let themselves be carried away by impulses, jealousy and resentment as she did. Whether they will let her do this, I see it as complicated. But still, we do not know if the woman's account of the events is true, if it really was in self-defense, or if it was a crime that involved betrayal, revenge, and even witchcraft. Even so, whatever the reason, Andrea committed one of the worst acts, which was to take the life of her best friend. Remember that on Pepe Mysterio's channel, you can find the podcast. Just put in the YouTube search Pepe Mysterio podcast and a playlist will come up at the top. And by now you can find about five or six videos. Among them is the one about Anita, a woman who was deprived of her freedom and ended up taking the life of her tormentor 